so now uh, we can start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Let me welcome you all to this event to launch the book on powering a learning society during an age of disruption, which is co-edited by uh, Mr. Sung Supra, Director of the Human and Social Development Division, South Asia Department, and concurrently Chair of Education Sector Group at the Asian Development Bank, Shanti Jagannathan, Principal Education Specialist uh, with the Education Sector Group at Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department uh, at ADB, and uh, Professor Rupert McLean, adjunct professor in the School of Education at RMIT University, Melbourne, Australia, and adjunct professor of the International Education at the University of Tasmania, Tasmania, Australia. This is a joint publication of ADB and Springer. Uh, let me uh, note uh, a point made by a Nobel laureate, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, uh, in, in his foreword, which is very important. This new approach recognizes that development is about more than closing the gap in resources that separate developed and developing countries, but closing the gap in knowledge as well. And more than that, the ability to learn and respond to the inevitable shocks and disruptions that confront uh, the economy and society. Therefore, the book comes at a very critical juncture when we are all committed to build back better the education systems that uh, have been disrupted in unprecedented ways by reimagining and rethinking education. Let me cite two quotes to demonstrate the importance of knowledge and learning. The first one is from Mahatma Gandhi. Live as if you were to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were to live forever. The second quote is from Albert Einstein. Uh, Once you stop learning, you start dying. Such is the value of learning and, and it's, it's been there for such a long time. With rapid technological changes and impact of climate change, we, are, uh, uh, we see growing uncertainties, which is often labeled as a VUCA world, vulnerable, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Therefore, the growing emphasis on developing is on developing self-directed lifelong learners who can navigate such an uncertain world and find their solutions. For this to happen naturally, it is important that all education institutions work in tandem by focusing on creating a learning society. We'll learn about the focus of the book and its implications. Let, uh, let me start with, uh, uh, with uh, requesting uh, Mr. Kenichi Yokohama, Director General of the South Asia Regional <laughs> Department at the Asian Development Bank, and Mr. Bruno Krasko, Director General of the Sustainable Development Bank uh, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department at the ADB. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, good uh, afternoon, good morning, good day, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the South Asia Department, I'm, uh, let me thank you very much. Uh, and also, I'm happy uh, together with Bruno uh, to launch this book, Powering uh, a Learning Society uh, During the, an Age of Disruption, uh, which is published by ADB. Uh, it is an edited volume of uh, 21 articles and presents the views of uh, leading experts on, on the role of a learning society in education and training. I'd like to congratulate Sun Supra and the co-editors, Shanti Jagannathan and uh, Rupert uh, McLean for putting together uh, such a, a versatile group of people to write about this topic. Uh, this book uh, comes at uh, a very opportune time with accelerating digitization, growing need for lifelong learning for job markets, that keep changing uh, at a rapid pace, uh, disruptive technologies and other demographic and environmental uh, trends such as aging, climate change, etc. Uh, it has become critical that the uh, learning society is actively supported. 
uh, it has become more important now than ever before uh, to strengthen the role of uh, societies and uh, communities in education. As COVID-19 uh, shifted uh, uh, learning to the homes of students, it has become clear uh, that we cannot ignore the role of societies in education. An effective learning society is the one where good opportunities for learning is available to all, irrespective of age, gender, race, and uh, socioeconomic status. Whether young or old, everyone needs to uh, be a part of a learning society. As people stay longer years in the workforce, where skills required in the job market keep shifting, and skills and knowledge acquired in early stage education and training becomes obsolete quickly. A learning society helps us to adapt to new domains and the work practices. This calls for multiple channels of learning going well beyond traditional brick and mortar institutions. So ADB is privileged to have partners with an illustrious group of education thought leaders. Uh, the others come from uh, leading universities uh, throughout the world, such as the uh, National University of Singapore, Oxford University, and Seoul National University. Prominent civil society organizations such as uh, Prasam and Teach for the Philippines. Government initiatives like the Institute of Cyber Education. Illustrious global think tanks like uh, Brookings Institution, professional education services agencies such as Australian Council for Education Research, large global uh, providers of online education like uh, Coursera, international organizations like UNESCO and ILO, European skills institutes like European Training Foundation and Skillman, non-traditional skills providers like uh, the National Skills Academy for Rail in the UK, private equity firms focusing on education such as Kaizen Best. So our thanks to this great group of professionals for contributing uh, their time and energy to this uh, book. Within ADB, this book presents an excellent collaboration between operations and knowledge department, which is South Asia and the sustainable development climate change departments. The authors have brought unique and variable perspectives on the role of a learning society. The book tells us uh, that many actors have to play a part in strengthening the fabric of a learning society. A robust learning society will make people of all age groups and uh, different stages of life become active learners in passing through transformational changes and in, co and in coping with disruptions. And most of all, uh, be engaged and be productive members of the society, uh, thereby achieving the sense of self-fulfillment and happiness. I'd like to welcome all the participants in this webinar, uh, thanking you for joining this session. And uh, we would be delighted to hear your views and suggestions to the authors, co-editors, and the ADB. So we want to learn from you how to uh, you know, put these thoughts in, in, in our operations. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ken. Good, good afternoon. Um, I am very delighted to uh, join Ken, Rajesh, Sunsup, Shanti, Rupert, and many colleagues in this book launch event. Through this book launch, we have uh, gathered today, not just the co-editors and authors, but many of the education experts in ADB. I've had the opportunity to leaf through the book and I am very impressed with the excellent collection of expert views on the importance of a learning society uh, combined into this publication. I want to, like uh, Ken, congratulate Sunsup, Shanti, Rupert, and all those who have contributed to this book. I had a chance to leaf through the book and uh, I recommend it to all, not just uh, education experts, but also those who have interests uh, in developing learning societies 
a key theme throughout this book. With COVID-19 bringing the great disruptions that we have observed, policymakers are compelled to think about reshaping education. This is certainly a very important agenda across the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department and in ADB as a whole. ADB and other development partners are indeed committed to refocusing attention and resources into what we refer to as reimagining education and training, and particularly to suit the learning styles of millennials and Generation Z. And of course, to meet more importantly, the needs of future societies. I, I believe together with Sun Soup, uh, we are part of the baby boom generation. And although now some generations back, I do appreciate how the concept of learning has evolved over the years. As part of our regular work, ADB has published a guidance note on COVID-19 and education in Asia and the Pacific that recommends going beyond the immediate COVID-19 crisis and to initiate far-reaching reforms that would make education more resilient. We are increasingly made aware that as part of the, what we refer to as solutions bank, and to be more effective and client-centric in supporting our developing member countries, we need to look at the future. Think of uh, projecting five to 10 years out and ensure that our countries are indeed better, better prepared to face the challenges and build successfully uh, on these challenges for a prosperous, inclusive and resilient Asia. I often remind uh, many of my great SDCC colleagues that we need to better understand today, tomorrow's problems. This guidance note uh, that I refer to frames actions to be taken in three R's, response during the closure of education institutions, recovery when institutions reopen, and try to make up for the lost time and rejuvenation where institutions undertake long range reforms to modernize teaching and learning with new tools. Developing human capital across improvements in health and education is what it's all about. The human capital index update of 2020 stresses how essential it is to protect human capital in the face of COVID-19. Simulations conducted for this uh, 2020 report uh, of the Human Capital Index suggests that school closures combined with family hardships may indeed affect the accumulation of human capital throughout the current generation of school-aged children and lifetime earnings uh, reflecting on that capital accumulation relative loss. Uh, this is what economists uh, refer to as a scarring phenomenon. As in poverty alleviation, the adverse impact of the pandemic can result, uh, or sorry, can erase many hard fought gains in education through the previous decades, suggesting that the pandemic may roll back many years worth of uh, human capital progress. So rising from uh, this crisis requires therefore a broad range of partnerships. And that is what this book stresses among others. Another key aspect of the long range reforms is about education policies using a multi-sector approach for better impact. The right skills and talent can be powerful drivers of growth and prosperity in a knowledge-based economy. A multi-sectoral approach is strongly <laughs> advocated in ADB's strategy 2030. Societal changes tend to be interdisciplinary and require participation of different partners. I am a strong believer in a multi-sectoral or multi-thematic solutions to address many of the complexities uh, that we face uh, in today's developing countries, and in particular, some of the complex development challenges. At ADB, we support our developing member countries in the sectors of education, <laughs> health, urban development, transport, climate change, energy, water, agriculture, and finance. And increasingly, we aim to connect the dots and tap the synergy across these sectors and themes to build equitable and more prosperous economies and societies. At ADB, we constantly stress the importance of knowledge solutions with a one ADB approach, which brings together key internal stakeholders across sectors and uh, developed through diverse thinking. Lifelong learning for constantly aggregating new developments and lessons in an age of automation to enhance human capacity with up-to-date knowledge, skills, and attitudes matter far more now than we ever understood. 
it is really heartening to see that uh, Sun Tzu and the co-editors have produced this book uh, with an impressive group of professionals uh, from many different walks of life. Uh, we congratulate all of them and uh, we emphasize the need to do much more of such work. Um, in reading parts of the book, um, I was uh, very impressed with some of the key takeaways. Um, some of the ones that uh, I would like to share with you include, I think what uh, was referred to at the outset, the importance of investing in education and knowledge uh, to close the gap between developed and developing uh, countries. Um, another interesting point was uh, the role of behavioral change and how not only individuals, but also organizations and institutions ex adapt to an ever-changing global environment. Uh, perhaps another one is the idea of um, the importance of developing a culture of learning, and, and not just in schools uh, and colleges, but across all walks of life, uh, including in the workplace. So perhaps uh, on that note, we uh, come back to the common thread of learning as a lifetime journey. And with that, let me congratulate once again, the editors and authors and all those involved in preparing the book. A big thanks to them to join forces with us in analyzing and unpacking the building blocks or pathways to a future learning society. I very much look forward to taking this dialogue forward in ADB and with our partners. And I warmly welcome all the participants to this webinar and look forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ken and Bruno, for your remarks and underscoring uh, the importance of learning, you know, lifelong learning, and also setting the stage for the rest of the program. Let me now call upon the co-editors of the book to share their thoughts briefly, starting with uh, Shamsu, then uh, Santi, and, and Rupert. Uh, floor is yours, Shamsu. Thank you, Prajash. Also, uh, thank you, thank you for uh, Ken Yokohama <clears throat> and also uh, Bruno Carrasco, uh, two DG for uh, insightful and excellent opening remarks. Uh, that already captured the gist of the, the book, so I don't have to not to say not so much to say. But uh, <clears throat> when Corona nineteen, uh, the Corona COVID nineteen pandemic that when it broke out last year, it was towards like wake up call and also for the developing member countries of ADB. Developing member country are now looking for model, remodeling and re-engineering education and learning system and look into um, ADB uh, searching for a new solution. In search of solution, we reached out policymakers, practitioners, and also academic professionals. 40 thought leaders joined us. The book is outcome of 40 authors with 21 chapters. I, I noticed that there have been more than 27,000 plus downloads from Springer. So this book become very popular. I would like to thank contributing author Santi and uh, Rupert, co-editors, and support from the uh, uh, Mr. Yokohama and also Mr. Carrasco, 2DG, <coughs> and publication technical team from ADB and Springer. With this book, we try to find a way to address four key challenges. First, widening learning gap. Over the last decades, our uh, developing member country and ADB have been, invest, have been investing in education. And there have been significant improvement in terms of access to school, but it doesn't translate into closing learning gap between urban and rural and also haves and have not. Attending school does not necessarily mean learning. India, for example, the, according to a National Achievement Survey, about more than one third of the grade three students cannot understand simple text or <coughs> do math expected at that grade. The proportion of students who cannot perform grade specific reading or math increase at higher grade. 
Children who fail to learn to read and compute at grade three are likely to stay behind, even when they advance to higher grade. Second, quality and relevance of learning. The world is changing rapidly. And with digitalization automation, skills demand and nature of work are changing rapidly. With these rapid changes, whatever we learn in school will become obsolete very soon. But school have not kept this pace. Third, multidisciplinary approach as the uh, DG uh, Bruno uh, also mentioned. As we, can see, as we can see from the COVID-19 pandemic, so societal challenges such as climate change, environmental uh, dis degradation we face require multi-sectoral interdisciplinary collaborative <coughs> approach to solve. <coughs> First, <coughs> lifelong learning. We need to promote a culture of learning where continuous and lifelong learning are promoted in the context of rapid changes and also uncertainty of future market and societies. It will be even more critical to promote learning, how to learn, learnability and learning as agility to develop and build a new skill will be crucial attribute in the learning society. These are very daunting challenges. School alone cannot address these challenges. Schools cannot be lone frontier. Enterprise, local and regional authority, research institution, apprenticeship, and most importantly, local community, starting from family, need to contribute, create, and support the weight of the societal learning. As one of approach to help address these challenges, this book highlights the importance of creating and empowering a learning society. In learning society, all actors in the society, including not traditional actors, such as city planner, technology companies, etc., should play a pivotal role in improving the quality and relevance of learning as a lifelong journey. Integration of a learning opportunity among private and public actor would be key for developing learnability and reskilling. Firms and employers can also partner with education institutions to promote workplace learning. Education system need to focus on learning to learn to enable this lifetime learning. These all require a re-engineering of our society as a learning society. For this, we need to assess every aspect of a society need and also public policy and practice through the learning, learning lens. Not only the learning of individual, but organization, institutional learning as well. Advances in technology have enhanced the capacity of a society to support lifelong learning. We need to take advantage of this advance in creating and supporting learning society. As Stiglitz said, whom are very, we are very grateful for this, uh, his forward into this book. This book represented a major step forward in the orient reorientation of the development thinking. As the uh, uh, DG uh, Carrasco mentioned at the beginning, this is a closing gap in knowledge and also more importantly, closing gap in terms of the ability to learn, ability to respond to shock and changes. Again, thank you very much, all the co-author, all co-editor and authors, all contributing team. Thank you very much. So shall I go next? Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, thank you, DGs, and um, hello, everyone. And thank you so much for um, joining us today. At first, I'd like to uh, say it's been a great privilege and a wonderful experience working with this amazing group of authors who've contributed their 
thinking, ideas, and aspirations in the articles in the book. Uh, uh, reading through their articles, I learned a lot as, as they really cover a very wide and diverse range of topics and themes that bear influence on the future of education. So I wish we could have had a day long event with all the authors and co-authors, all 40 of them being able to share their thoughts and views. Uh, but since the pandemic, there's such a profusion of online events that it's very difficult to do day long uh, events. Uh, instead, we hope that we can have followed this event with more focused on tables uh, with groups of authors, you know, unpacking some of the themes that have been covered in this uh, book and also looking at how to take forward this dialogue and, and not just leave it there. Um, like DG Bruno and DG Ken mentioned, the timing is particularly propitious for the coming together of this you know, group of people from diverse settings to talk about education recovery from COVID, but also reimagining and re rejuvenating how education can play a part in the future. Like Songsuk mentioned, education is not just the sole responsibility of schools, or universities, governments, or public service agents. Uh, the book highlights that more than ever before, education is everyone's responsibility, and we need to have that kind of a long range thinking uh, to reap the benefits of investing in uh, education and bringing impact on individuals and societies. So, um, in this journey, the role of traditional partners like schools, colleges, and stakeholders like teachers and as technologies change, as societies change, they need to become more agile agents in a future learning society. At the same time, other actors, like those mentioned by the speakers before me, whether it's civic and municipal authorities or urban planners, transport professionals, um, CSOs, they all need to step up their game in contributing um, their, their uh, expertise, their knowledge, and their work in helping uh, to make uh, education work, not just for children and youth, but also for mid-career people and for older people who will now be looking to stay longer and longer in the workforce. So in our learning society of the future, we need to also bridge this whole physical and virtual systems bridge uh, uh, as a systems gap and ensure that it supports uh, people in different stages of life, in ge different geographic settings, and, and also different phases of, of the working career. So cultural systems like museums, libraries, art galleries, sport facilities, I mean, they all are, are going to have a growing role to play in supporting education systems. So it's not just about technical knowledge that matters, but also how citizens find themselves in the larger fabric of a learning society, how, how they can build and nurture their skills and talents in different areas that will matter more. Employers are increasingly looking for people who are multifaceted. Um, you know, we've heard about multiple intelligences, right, in education. Uh, Howard Gardner has written about eight different types, uh, linguistic, logical, mathematical, musical, kinesthetic, spatial, uh, interpersonal, naturalist. So nurturing these types of multiple intelligences um, require many uh, institutions to play a part and to join this uh, kind of journey in keeping um, ed education at the front end of development. So in many ways, education uh, has to play a lead role. I mean, has to lead the change. So if for that to for that to work, a learning society with everyone involved uh, becomes even more important. So these are exciting times. And I'm very ha happy to be part of this effort together with all the other education enthusiasts who joined us in this book. Thank you so much. Over to you, Rupert. If you look at the essence of this book, as many have pointed out, what we're really concerned about is looking at the development of learning societies um, at a time of major disruption in our various countries and in fact worldwide. That's the first thing. The second is we're looking at the reorientation of development thinking. In the past, development thinking has mainly stressed looking at reducing the resources gap between countries between developed countries and developing countries, the income per capita 
in countries and trying to reduce the gap between wealthy countries and countries that haven't got the same sort of economic basis. But what we're looking at in this book is the need to uh, look at a different way of looking at development, to look at the matter of closing the gap in knowledge between countries. During a time when we have the information age and we have knowledge societies and economies. And this requires us to adopt a major reorientation of development thinking. And this is stressed by Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz in his foreword to the book. So we, we need to look at what we can do to promote learning societies. And when we look at learning societies, we wanna make sure that learning is for everyone regardless of age or gender or regional location, that is relevant to the needs of individuals and their communities, that is high quality, that is equitable, that it's inclusive. And this also, and I think it's very important to say, ethically based, ethically based. So these are all areas that are very important that need to be accommodated when it comes to the changing patterns of learning societies. We need to look at how we can strengthen and upgrade education and training to fulfill the sort of vision we have of the type presented in the book. Now, we have all gone through major, all countries and individuals have gone through major disruptions, um, but we're mainly stressing, I suppose, in our presentation today, perhaps so far, the question of the COVID-19 health pandemic. And that's had an impact on education and training. It's an impact on how we deliver education. Um, many students no longer attending classrooms, but having to be uh, homeschooled, for example. The increasing use of technologies and things of that type when it comes to reaching learners. But we have to also remember that there are many other areas of disruption that have a major impact on learning societies and on the way in which we organize education and training. There is the information and communication technology revolution, which is really impacting enormously the various countries. We have the fourth industrial revolution, which is having again a great impact on what we need to teach in education and training and the way in which we deliver that education and training. We have industry 4.0, the changes in the business sector in the light of the fourth industrial revolution. We have the increasing and disruptive impact of artificial intelligence. Also the greening of economies and societies and an increasing emphasis on equity issues and inclusive education. All of these things are, are highly disruptive and really require us to rethink what we need to be achieving in education and training. So in looking at this, we have to stress the importance of partnerships. Education and training are too complex and too important to just be left to governments. We can't expect them to be able to achieve all the things that need to be achieved. We have to look at partnerships that involve parents, learners, civil society, the business sector, the international development community, and fostering productive partnerships is extremely important if we're going to achieve the benefits of learning societies. It's also important that education and training is lifelong, and a number of other speakers have referred to that, that it recognises the importance of adopting a holistic approach to uh, education and training. So we involve not just formal, but non-formal and informal learning as well. So these areas of disruption, which are examined in the book, have a profound impact on education and training and on the characteristics and content of learning societies. So I think the book is on a very important topic. I believe we've drawn together a very talented, expert, experienced range of authors who provide very many insights and directions on the best pathways to adopt in future. 
how can we most effectively prepare our citizens? How can we most effectively meet the needs of our communities when it comes to um, the future of learning societies in all countries, whether they are developing or developed? Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Sungsoo, uh, Santi, and uh, Rupert for uh, shedding light on uh, how uh, this book is organized and, and sharing uh, you know, some of the key messages coming out of this book. Now, uh, let me shift to uh, the expert uh, panel. Uh, we have two experts today, uh, Professor Mo uh, Moritz Van Rusen, Chairman of Gismas, Board of Governors uh, and Chief Academic Officer of Global Systems at Global University Systems, and Mr. Living Wang, uh, Chief Section for Educational Innovation and Skills Development at UNESCO to share your expert views. Uh, let me also remind the audience, uh, uh, while uh, you know, uh, the experts are sharing their views, please put up your questions on, uh, on the Q&A box. Uh, so that we can, uh, when we move to that section, we can have more lively discussions. Uh, so now the floor is yours, uh, Professor uh, Ruzan. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, to be part of this, this exciting uh, launch of a very important publication. And uh, thank you very much also for your introduction. Um, greetings from London, uh, Global University Systems. I'm the chief academic officer of that. I'm, I'm kind of the person who put that together. Uh, is based in, in, in London, UK, the headquarters, and that's why I'm, I'm here. But uh, as you uh, said in your introduction, I'm also uh, the uh, rector of uh, University of Europe for Applied Sciences in Germany and a board chairman of GISMA in Germany and a few other positions. So actually I divide my time between uh, the UK and Germany. Um, but originally I'm from halfway, uh, the Netherlands, uh, and uh, started my academic career as a proper academic at Utrecht University and then at a number of other institutions. But most of my career has been in management positions in universities. And that gives a bit of a color to my reaction uh, to uh, this uh, publication. So first of all, I want to say this book gives me a lot of hope and, and reasons to be cheerful. And I want to thank the 40 plus authors who have contributed to it. And let me explain to you why. I'm going to make a couple of three or four main statements. Uh, first of all, a very obvious one, but uh, something which is often forgotten. And that is learning is the lifeblood of the knowledge economy. Lifelong learning has been referred to many times. It's, it's an old concept, uh, rightly so. It's, it, I think if my memory serves me well, it, it dates back to something like the 1980s and then uh, was taken to the political forefront, especially in the 1990s and onwards by people like Jacques Delors, the then president of the European Commission, who really uh, said lifelong learning is the future for any knowledge economy, it's, it's our key to prosperity. Looking at that way, uh, given all the words which have been uh, given to, to promote uh, lifelong learning by politicians and others, you could say it's not been a big success so far, otherwise we wouldn't have this session. But maybe that's misleading because it also uh, means we actually look at lifelong learning in a very narrow way, and that is linked to uh, formal learning. And, and as the point is rightly made uh, by uh, previous speakers and in the book, uh, really non-formal learning, uh, informal learning represents 90 plus percent. I mean, some colleagues have, have estimated that well above 90 percent of all the learning in society. Um, so when it comes to why knowledge economies have developed, actually probably the answer to that, you have to look much more into the non-formal and informal uh, education. Employers, many employers have embraced uh, the learning concept. They know that uh, uh, learning is their key to the success of their business. They cannot prosper 
in modern society uh, without actually investing in learning of their employees and of their company as a whole. And of course, the same is true for those who work. Um, it's very difficult nowadays to, uh, to be successful in a career without embracing the fact that you continuously have to learn, not just formally getting new pieces of paper, but also informally. And, and many of us have gone through this process in, in terms of you know, trying to understand the quick developments on all the different video conferencing systems and so on, which is really also a form of learning. Those who could not do that, unfortunately, will certainly not be at this session, right? So it's, it's, it's essential to stay uh, in touch and to continue moving forward. Universities and colleges have not maybe been always that effective in, in addressing that. And you cannot blame them. They are focused and they are funded on uh, really preparing young people for a career. Uh, that's really their main focus. So private providers have been filling, filling that uh, vacuum. Uh, so especially private providers have been very, very active in the non-formal and informal learning. And of course, they do have the advantage of uh, economies of scale. Now, with uh, the COVID situation, EdTech has received a major uh, boost and uh, acceptability of also getting your uh, knowledge much more online uh, really will help further that process of, of uh, uh, informal and non-formal learning, learning outside the traditional classroom. And that links into another very important thing, and that is globalization. I've said this many times, and I cannot uh, fail to repeat it again. Uh, education is not, nor should wish to be immune to globalization. Knowledge is global. It is very difficult to monopolize knowledge in a modern world. That is actually an, a very positive uh, statement because it's also an opportunity, for instance, for developing nations. And, and Rupert made a, com and a comment about that as well, and rightly so, that really uh, through learning, we can uh, uh, create a much more um, level playing field in social economic terms in the world. Of course, there is protectionism. Um, there will be protectionism in, in, in some areas, though history so far has shown that protectionism, especially by nation states and up to a certain extent also by, by big multinationals, pharma industry, et cetera, tend to be more delaying uh, the spread of knowledge rather than really truly monopolize it in a, in a big way. Linked to that is the point of uh, learning as a means to liberalize, um, especially in a social economic uh, context. Right? So it is both at nations, it's also at individual level. And in that sense, um, for those who actually feel knowledge, maybe in learning in particular, teaching is a way to control, this can also be a little bit uh, tricking some anxiety. It is disruptive to society. And uh, in that sense, there is an, an, an understandable, but I think not really defensible, pushback when it comes to uh, the way learning is, is spreading through uh, society. I will not go too much into that detail, but I think we all know that that's for some politicians, uh, ideologists, or religious leaders, and so on, knowledge, learning, etc., can also be seen as a uh, threat. My view on that is that if you try to uh, prevent, frustrate uh, uh, learning in a society, you hamper uh, the, the uh, prosperity of that society. And that triggers frustrations. And I think history has shown that most of the time that has proven to be very risky for, for leaders. So I hope that leaders around the world actually uh, are enlightened and, and embrace the importance of learning in the development of, an, uh, of the knowledge economy. Globalization uh, means that uh, we can also create a much bigger scale. Um, it therefore becomes much more affordable. And of course, the emerging lingua francas in, in, in the world, and especially English, that's, that's a feature of globalization 
uh, does uh, facilitate that enormously. It means that learning more and more, and the point has been made very well in the book and, and also today uh, by some of my the other speakers, uh, is, is it's escaping uh, the classroom. Uh, it is escaping history even. So the idea that uh, learning is always teacher-focused, uh, teacher-centric, professor-centric, is a very archaic idea. Uh, community of learners is much more the future with uh, professors much more as facilitators. And very importantly, uh, the concept that learning is something uh, you do to prepare for life, and which stops at the age of, well, depending on what life you have been given, uh, at the age of maybe 15, 16, maybe 23, that's a totally a dated uh, concept. And, uh, and that historical force, which still tries to keep learning very much linked, locked up in a classroom and locked up in certain age groups is definitely uh, on the way out. And in that sense, as I said, this book gives a lot of hope. None of this is triggered by COVID-19, but it certainly has accelerated uh, this development. It accelerated the, the edtech as a tool. It has accelerated the globalization of learning and the liberalization of uh, knowledge. So in summary, learning, is the lifeblood of the knowledge society. The book makes this point extremely well. There are very powerful drivers behind uh, learning society, the emerging learning society, and they are not actually the ones you might expect to see. It is not really that much driven by politicians, whatever they say, it's actually much more driven by business, which have a vested interest in, in embracing this. It's driven by individuals who have vested interest in uh, uh, embracing this. And uh, governments can though play a very important role there and that is removing uh, regulatory obstacles. I mean, the, the, there is a lot of rules and regulations in society uh, which are actually there to defend vested interest and, and certain forms of protectionism. And governments definitely can force those rules and regulations a little bit out of the way, liberalize there as well, um, because that actually will help enormously in stimulating uh, the, the knowledge economy. <coughs> and then of course, finally, but certainly not last, uh, the, the importance of globalization in all this, that we do not want to contain uh, learning as purely as a nation state uh, uh, um, dimension, but that we uh, uh, see that actually uh, we can benefit in this sense by from globalization and and creates and globalization can create big opportunity for all. So those are my uh, ten minute comments. I want to say once again, thank you very much for this book. It illustrates uh, in the various developments as 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 uh, featured in the chapters that there is enormous hope and encouragement for uh, the world and the role of learning in, in our uh, knowledge economy. So thank you very much to the editors and all the authors. Thank you. Uh, Living, please uh, go ahead with your uh, thank you. brief comment. Thank you. thank you very much, uh, Director Generals of ADB, uh, colleagues, uh, peer participants. Uh, warm greetings from UNESCO and thank you for the invitation uh, to this book launch. A very good afternoon to all of you as we uh, gather virtually today to celebrate the launch of an ADB supported book on powering a learning society during an age of disruption. First, congratulations to all our three co-editors and each of the authors for this very timely and relevant work especially as we face the ongoing challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has transformed the social landscape in all aspects of our life, including education and learning. Humans are born with the ability to learn, whether it is in the form of informal, non-formal and the formal learning, when the concept of lifelong learning or lifelong education was initially introduced 
it was more for adults to continue their learning after leaving the school system, either for work or for life. But now lifelong learning has been expanded to cover all levels and the types of learning with diverse learning objectives and the modes of delivery, including online and offline learning, formal, non-formal and informal learning. We know that lifelong learning not only applies to individuals, but also to organizations, government, and our country. With diverse pathways and modes of learning, school and classroom-based learning, which was traditionally regarded as the formal learning, is no longer the dominant uh, type of learning. Uh, we have seen increasing use of uh, technology to enable uh, online learning at scale, uh, as well as work-based and community-based learning in the delivery of uh, innovative learning programs. The landscape of higher education is also changing rapidly. Uh, going forward, higher education and the TVET have an increasingly important role to play in strengthening our shared knowledge and the educational commons for sustainable development. Universities house much of the world's potential for knowledge and research production and require renewed investments to transform high learning. UNESCO hopes to work with ADB and our stakeholders in these key areas to help nurture and transform tertiary education and learning. Today's publication shows us a broad and important way forward that lifelong learning is an integral part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which is also echoed throughout the book. A key message regarding sustainability in our future from this book is that we need to shift our thinking and understanding of development from closing resource gaps to closing knowledge and learning gaps for learners worldwide. The role of diverse actors working towards a common goal of equitable access to lifelong learning opportunities to all is key to building a learning society and is a major contribution of the book we are discussing here today. Drawing on this key message, uh, UNESCO has called on stakeholders uh, at all levels to reimagine our collective futures to achieve sustainable development through quality education. UNESCO's uh, Global Initiative on the Futures of Education aims to catalyze this ongoing debate and actions to reimagine uh, education as part of a broad, open, consultative process uh, that involves youth, educators, civil society, governments, business, and other stakeholders. We believe this new book uh, makes an important contribution uh, to this global debate. This impressive book presents uh, a collection of good policies and practices that uh, will continue to resonate uh, during the pandemic pandemic and into the future. UNESCO looks forward to facilitating that dialogue uh, in the context of SDG4. Together with ADB and all stakeholders, we need to accelerate uh, progress towards SDG4 in order to reach our collective aspirations across all the 17 SDGs. Together, we can build a new and inclusive learning society based on peace and the prosperity for all. We are grateful for, for our collaboration with ADB and welcome this new resource as we shape the road ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I was having some connection problems, so sorry if uh, it didn't come out well. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Moritz and, and Living for the excellent points. Uh, this uh, program has already highlighted so many important aspects of uh, a learning society and the interdisciplinary approach that is required to optimize learning. We'll come to that later on. I am cognizant about the time. Uh, uh, we, we do not have uh, a lot of time remaining. Uh, in order to uh, sort of make it efficient, uh, let, me, let me ask, uh, 
Uh, I understand there are some uh, colleagues who want to raise some questions. Let me start with uh, uh, Margarita Pavlova. Dr. Pavlova uh, is from uh, Education U University of Hong Kong. Uh, why don't you go ahead? Uh, okay. Margarita. Hello. Good, good, good afternoon, everyone. And it is such an exciting event. And um, every time ADB is um, collaborating with Springer, I think it's a perfect way to engage more and more stakeholders into knowing your work. So congratulations um, on that um, yes, approach that you used um, over several years already. So, and of course, I fully agree that um, educational system is just one partner in developing learning communities. But my question is still about um, education and training. So can you comment on the path of change, education and training um, accommodate challenges and opportunities caused by COVID, for example, fourth industrial revolution, sustainable development agenda to have a positive um, impact on learning societies? Or can you provide an example? So what are the evidence? Because the, you know this big picture, what is happening um, in the region. So maybe you can comment on that. And I know it's a very big question, but if you can provide one example, that would be very interesting. And I'm looking forward to read the all parts of the book. So uh, who wants to take this question? Uh, maybe I can just start and then others can yeah, jump go ahead, in. Uh, so yeah, thanks, Margarita. Good to see you again. Uh, you know, I'll just pick up on one point on the fourth uh, industrial revolution. This is something that has been, I think, preoccupying so many of us. And there was all this, uh, you know, fear around the, this whole disruptive nature of the fourth industrial revolution technologies and then what it would do to jobs and what the market would, would look like. And so we've been doing a series of studies on that. And, and one of the things that we found, we studied about eight sectors across four countries. Um, uh, in, in ASEAN and another one is uh, currently underway in the Central West region. One of the key findings we found that, uh, yes, indeed, these technologies are bringing disruptive changes and they are bringing, um, uh, you know, pressure on uh, routine and uh, routine tasks. So people who are doing routine on uh, kind of automatable tasks are at risk of losing jobs. But at the same time, skills, investing in skills is the lever to, uh, to benefit from the upside of these technologies. Mm -hmm. And across all these eight sectors that we studies in the four countries, we came up with estimates of positive job creation from the wow. increasing productivity that will come from investing in skills, um, and from you know, improving our knowledge around these things. And also another aspect which relates to the learning society concept is that uh, you know it's no longer within the four walls of educational institutions of, like mm -hmm. on the job learning will play an extremely important part uh, mm -hmm. in this whole upskilling and reskilling and this has also been uh, proved by the COVID-19 experience of disruption uh, right. that we, we that we really need to be far more agile and far more ready to uh, have investments from different actors. So, so in the interest of okay. time, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Shanti. Uh, in, in the interest of time, I see, uh, let me move on. Uh, Professor uh, Thomas Schroeder from University of Dortmund, Germany. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, uh, Thomas Schroeder from Technical University of Dortmund. I'm holding the UNESCO share for TVET and competence development for the future of work. And thank you very much to ADB, to the editors and to the authors for, and I hope that this very meaning, meaningful piece of work will ignite uh, a long overdue discussion on how to embed educational systems into the entire society and to provide something which will, which will, which will maybe change the mindset with respect to learning. We've heard this before. Um, it's not only the, the structure, it's, a, it's as well the, the way we should, we should regard learning, didactical approaches, learning venues, et cetera, et cetera. My question is, um, from your point of view, from ADP's point of view, what, what do you think, um, how, how, are, how are the nations um, um, prepared to accommodate current major areas of disruptions and um, and, um, and on what, what, 
where do you see or what do you think will be the role of TVET in this process? Thank you. So, uh, Songsup, uh, would you like to take it or uh, uh, Santi? Uh... Uh, maybe I, I take it very, very quickly. Uh, thanks, uh, the Professor uh, Thomas Schurt uh, for excellent question. Yes, uh, the, I completely agree that it's now time to change the culture of learning and change your mindset, not just on the physical investment. Your questions on the how the society, nation really prepare for the shock and like disruption, and then particularly role of Tibet. Uh, some countries really well prepared, for example, country like Singapore, they have a skills future initiative, whole of nation approach they're taking in terms of the uh, learning. Uh, they are much more uh, showing the much more resilience compared to other country. But in some country, a bit difficult to name it, but you know, particularly TV sector, severely, I would say, disrupted it. Because in Tibet, TV sector, usually the learning mode is usually face-to-face. -face. Now we cannot simply cannot have the classroom. So this one really telling us importance of the lo creating learning society, right? Not just only <clears throat> this one, I think the, um, the professor uh, Ruizin also mentioned in his, uh, the, uh, his uh, view, he said that when we have a well-established learning society, to sit, you know, we could resiliently respond to this. In fact, I completely agree that that didn't happen. So I would say difficult to say in the Tibet area, but I say in the less developing country, much more affected by Tibet in, the, in this sector than even formal education sector. So in coming back, uh, in terms of even equality perspective, in terms of the uh, uh, societal uh, impact, when I look at it, we have to really uh, reimagine Tibet also uh, learning system uh, in light of this uh, disruption we are facing. Uh, hope that I can uh, <laughs> uh, answer, satisfy some That's part of your answer. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you, Sun uh, uh Yeah, I again, we are running out of time. Uh, Living, uh, uh, you, you, you want to share your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just, yeah, go just, ahead, just, briefly. Yeah. Just, just want to briefly uh, uh, respond uh, by this uh, very important question. As you know, that uh, in the SDG uh, uh, global agenda, uh, Tibet is more important, more visible than, than the previous SD, uh, Millennium Development Goals. Actually, the, the reason is very, very simple, actually. Uh, 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 literacy and uh, numeracy uh, is only the basis. Uh, but if a country would like to develop uh, economic, uh, promote economic development, TVET and higher education is more productive actually in producing the human resources needed uh, for countries, you know, uh, to uh, develop economically. So uh, you, if you can compare the difference between uh, Millennium Development Goals and the SDG4, you can see the difference, uh, the high visibility. Uh, on TVET and higher education. So uh, I think this is quite obvious. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Living. Uh, maybe last question from uh, Dr. Leonie Wheeler from RMIT University, uh, Australia. Please go ahead, brief question. Um, thank you very much. And I enjoyed um, taking part in uh, writing a chapter and also the other chapters. Um, in Australia, we have a growing, um, a, a small but growing number of <coughs> cities that are learning cities and are rural communities that think learning is a driver of change. And we've got some really good stories coming out of our practitioners. But my question is, how do we get these stories out more to other communities, perhaps in our own nation, but also globally too? We have very dynamic um, communities who are who are going to have a global learning festival. That's one way, but what are the other ways that we can get these stories out? Uh, Professor Moritz, you wanted to say something also earlier. Uh, do you want to respond to this question? Yeah, sure. I, I think that's a very good point. And, and I, I try to make a comment about that also in, in my contribution about how we are moving from traditional going to a campus, going into a building, going into a classroom and 
listen to the professors and then go out again and now we have learned or, or even just reading a book and having learned uh, into much more a an, an community of learning and that's really what is so important also in, in a rural context which is that you create communities of learning uh, whether that's virtual communities or real communities. And, and the point is very well made, is that uh, um, you have to approach this in, in a globalized world as a global uh, uh, thing. So it is, how can you uh, link local learning communities, uh, virtual communities or real learning communities with other uh, uh, local learning communities as well, and create a global learning community. And I think that is, going to be the, the most exciting opportunity uh, we have in the, in the decades to come. Um, so, so my own organization, Global University System, is very much based on the concept that you create an ecosystem at global level, but that's still in, the, in, in a slightly more formal uh, context. And I think there is another big opportunity there for creating that global learning community by linking local communities. Um, why am I saying this? It's because we should not be afraid to share learning. I mean, there is sometimes an, an idea that we should defend our interest and that we, uh, and that's a lot of uh, the way society is organized is actually defending vested interest. In fact, the, the need for learning in society, in the knowledge economy is so huge that there is not this one provider or one government or whatever action which can actually fulfill that need. Uh, there is all kind of other actions which try to fill that vacuum. Uh, corporate universities, why do corporate universities exist? We got already universities. Do they need to exist? Yes, they need to exist because our traditional universities cannot provide that kind of uh, uh, knowledge for companies. That's why you get corporate uh, community, um, um, universities. Uh, the role of private providers are mentioned uh, briefly, which are becoming more and more prominent because they have the advantage of economies of scale. Uh, you're absolutely right uh, to, to uh, flag up also the importance of uh, you know, community learning and how to connect those communities together. It's another way of all satisfying that massive need uh, for learning in order to be successful as, an, as a society, as also as an individual, right? A nice aligned interest. And um, there are many examples. I was quite pleased to, to also get the, exam, uh, the question from, from Germany. Uh, look, there are many examples how it can be done with the duala system, for instance, where corporate and universities come together and really align their agenda on, on, on learning. But also uh, maybe as an inspiring uh, example at, at the end, uh, one of the universities I was in charge of, a Dutch university called Neuhode, which had a very clear philosophy that when students graduated, they didn't leave the university. So they would stay with their alumni through all the stages of their career. They would see that as their responsibility, right? So you, you would always stay part of the university and therefore the university would always try to uh, provide you with, with not only knowledge and skills, but also connecting you with, with other uh, people who have a similar interest in, in, uh, in learning and creating you know, independent community groups of alumni uh, who would actually work together, et cetera. And I think this is an, a very powerful approach for even traditional universities without funding in place and so on really can make a big difference. And that is stop thinking of uh, graduation as commencement, as you say in America, as the end point, but actually saying, no, you're staying with us as part of our community for the rest of your life. And we also accept responsibility on that. And by the way, it actually can be also uh, cost recovery. It's another source of income if you want to put it in, in blunt economic terms as well. So very good question. I think what you are showing is, is the future. Uh, thank your you question very much. actually leads us focusing on the future, and that's very, very powerful. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Morris, for that uh, comprehensive and very insightful response. With that, I think it's a good time to wrap up. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers for their excellent insight. I understand that this is uh, just the beginning, uh, but setting the stage right on this matter, and, and the team will continue to share uh, and, and discuss uh, uh, and get uh, more deeply into this topic. Uh, but uh, I, I just want to say that traditional learning is not adequate, which is coming out quite eloquently. The new generation of self-directed learners 
uh, need to be exposed to different types of learning. Uh, there was also a reference to not limiting to classroom uh, and, and which uh, we, we have looked at that. Uh, also different forms of uh, education uh, are already uh, evolving and some of the examples we heard. Uh, so going forward, I think uh, the ecosystem approach becomes more important. Uh, the good thing is now we're talking about sustainable development goals and, and this integrated approach, multidisciplinary approach is what we need to do. And, and for that, again, partnership becomes very important. So I think this learning society is uh, uh, the currency for now, uh, uh, we should uh, take into account different uh, important critical aspects uh, uh, and then come together. So this is a very optimistic, optimistic uh, uh, view as Professor Moritz also pointed out. Once again, thank, thank you all for this. And audience, uh, I, I know you, you may have a lot of questions, uh, but if you have questions, please send that to us and we'll try to respond to those questions. But for now, thank you very much and take care. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye -bye. Thank you. Yeah, all of you.